just for the Boost the Tax Urban Supply Company, Facebook Thursday Live, and uh, welcome to the Iowa Great Lakes Winter Wonderland. We just had a quite of snow. I think we got it maybe um, eight inches to a foot of snow and a lot of wind with it. So it rearranged all the snow into large drifts, probably um, five to six to seven feet high. Running on a half a staff today because a lot of people couldn't make it to the to the shop, so uh, they're stuck at home. I think you know, uh, but the sun is shining. It's a beautiful day out there. The wind is, has subsided and the snow quit, and it's really pretty out there. But uh, yesterday was a different story, and we had to close down a little bit early. Any of you that uh, called in orders, probably uh, nobody answered the phone or uh, maybe had to go out a day late, but we're on track again. And, and uh, I think even FedEx didn't run today. A um, couple of the other carriers did, and we even yesterday, they couldn't fit everything in. We had so much. So uh, I think uh, within the next couple of days, we'll be all straightened out. So feel free to call in your orders and and uh, we'll get them out to you as quick as we can. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, lacquer paint. Last week we talked about waters and we touched on uh, uh, airbrushes. There's a lot of questions over the phone of people uh, wanting to know what airbrush to get and we're a little confused on um, what we talked about. So I'm going to do a brief uh, overlay of the airbrush situation. There's a lot of good airbrushes out there, and uh, people say, you know, how can you, how can you like that airbrush? Uh, how can I not use that one? I can only use one airbrush at a time, and um, it's a little bit like picking up a shotgun. Whichever one you feel good at, uh, when you, when you uh, go hot, and that's one you're going to grab. There's not just because I don't use, I don't use it. I can't use them all at once. So we'll we'll show you some really good products. Um, we're going to show you uh, lacquer paints. We're going to touch a little bit on safety. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, show you a few products that might help you along the way and take the guesswork out of uh, paint with lacquers. Last week we showed you um, acrylics. We showed you the Createx brand of acrylics. A lot of acrylic paints out there. And it doesn't matter if you're doing uh, mammal faces or... Um, reproduction fish or skin mount fish, bird bills, feet, um, they all need coloration of some sort. And uh, you kind of have a choice of, you can use oils, some people use oils, you can hand paint, um, a lot of people use pan pastels, but the majority of people choose an airbrush and then your choices are uh, acrylic water-based paint or lacquer. So we'll show you the lacquer uh, spectrum of airbrushing. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, touch on the pluses and minuses, and uh, with that, I think we'll get started. So when it comes to airbrushes, I think Brett and I talked about last week about uh, single action airbrushes, and there's several single action airbrushes, but there's two common ones that we use. Uh, single action means Again, we did this last week and I'll go through this as fast as I can, so not to bore you. Single action means the action of pushing down on the trigger, the one single action, gives you, it's going to give you both paint and air. The amount of paint, this is an H Pache airbrush. We talked about this, more pieces of taxidermy work have been um, airbrushed with this airbrush than I think any airbrush on the market. Uh, to adjust your paint, the amount of paint, you turn this little cone in the front. I think Brett showed you how to take that apart and clean it. It's very easy to clean, very easy to maintain. You adjust the amount of paint you want, push down the air, and the paint comes out the tube. That's one single action variety in a Pache. Another one is an Iwata, and uh, same thing, you push down for air, the paint comes out in the predetermined um, setting that you have and you adjust that one by this collar back here So you close it down for zero paint open it up for a little open it up more for a lot of paint 
That's the two most common single action airbrushes that we deal with. When it comes to uh, double action airbrushes, this is a harder steam back. And a lot of times when you see us uh, using an airbrush, you will see the needle exposed. And all of them come with a protective cap that you can paint through. Most of them are meant to be pulled off or unscrewed if they're a, a screw on and your needle will actually protrude, protrude through there. Um, if you can get much closer to your work, you can get more detailed work. The bad part about that is if you drop it, that needle is exposed probably a good, almost an eighth of an inch on this hardest steam back. And um, you can bend that pretty easily. And we're gonna show you how to fix that in a little bit too. I wanna, we have a great line of Iwana airbrushes. Um, this is a C version, um, the size of the cup. Um, it's a gravity fed, this is a C. The, the B version is smaller, has a smaller cup. Uh, again, my needle is exposed at the end because I have, on the Iwanas, it unscrews. On a double action airbrush, you push down for air and you pull back for the amount of paint you want. So it's a, called a double action. Push down, pull back. Push down, pull back. You can set the amount of paint that you want to come out of the nozzle with this little, I call it a governor, but it's a little set screw on the back. You can open it wide open and you can paint large volumes of paint or you can close it way down and you can get little micro spots if you want to. And then another version of that is a B. And the B um, just has a smaller cup. And like I think I'm, Brett mentioned last week, um, there's even an A which has almost zero cup at all. It has nothing more than a, a little hole in the top. You put a drop of paint in. That would be for real small amounts of paint applications. Um, you're not going to use a lot of paint. You're not going to waste a lot of paint. All of our airbrushes, most of them anyway, will have, um, we, like, we like the precision air control, it's called a pack valve, and by turning this, you can turn the air way down to where I get nothing, I can open it up a little bit. Now I probably have, I can barely hear it, I probably have just guessing, you won't know how much air pressure you're putting through this with the pack valve. Um, it's going to be by feel, but I'm going to guess that I got about 10 pounds of 10 psi coming out of there, or I can open it all the way up. Now, the airbrushes run in, in price from, um, I'm going to say in the $40 range for a single action pache, all the way up to um, I think our custom microns are in excess of $600 for a real precise high-end airbrush. Um, when you get an airbrush like that, you gotta take really good care of it. Um, clean it really good. 99% of the time, it's gonna be operator air, which I think we mentioned last week. Um, air is coming through this little nozzle. And also, most of our airbrushes um, we like the quick disconnect where I can change this airbrush out and I can put this one out. Uh, it's just like, just like the big couplers that you have on the big hoses. Just by pulling one off, putting one on. And that requires um, a little nipple specific to the airbrush that you're using and a quick disconnect. Some of the quick disconnects have the precision air control with them. Some of them have just the quick disconnect. Works pretty nice if you um, only have one hose coming out of your compressor and you want to uh, have a couple different airbrushes to use. Like I said, it's usually operator air when these, um, if these work or don't work. And you have air coming up through here. The air travels through this barrel it creates a vacuum on this one. It sucks the paint um, through a siphon bottle. This one is a siphon, siphon feed. 
sucks it through the siphon bottle and out through the tip. If anything doesn't work, you kind of have to problem solve these. And the first thing I will do is take thinner. Um, if I'm using, if I'm using lacquer paint, I'll use lacquer thinner. If I'm using acrylic paints, I'm going to use one of their reducers and I will attempt to spray the reducer through there because if, I know it won't be clogged. It won't have any chunks in the paint, won't be dirty paint. That will take out one of the um, reasons that it might not be working. So if it's not spraying your reducer or something thin, um, I may, and I'll, I want to listen to the air. I'm going to get a little bit of air or does it sound like the full um, PSI that I'm expecting to come out? I'm going to listen to how much air is coming out. If that's not the problem, I may take the nozzle off. Some of these airbrushes you'll see also have a cutout like this and the cutout is meant to pull this needle way back, pulls it way out of that cone, and if there's a little crumb of paint, if you have dirty paint, it'll maybe open it up enough to sh uh, shoot the crumb out and you can try paint again. Otherwise, you can dismantle it, you can take out the, the little tip, you can take out the needle um, and go as far as you need to go until it's going to work again. Um, the more familiar you are with these, the um, easier it's going to be to take apart. The first time you take one apart, you're going to be panicky because you're going to have so many parts laying there that you're going to be afraid that you're ruining something. Um, they all come with good directions. They come with um, schematics and diagrams, and it's real easy for you to watch a, a YouTube video um, to see how to take apart your specific airbrush and troubleshoot it. So that's a great aid for everything from lacquer paint to airbrushing to compressors, you know, all kinds of different aids on the YouTube that will help you out. Okay, um, like I said, you want to be real careful of them. You don't want to bend that needle. That needle has to stay very straight. If the needle happens to get bent to one side or the other, your paint, first of all, is going to paint crooked. It's going to paint off the center of the airbrush. It's also going to um, clog up because the paint will cling to any little bend in the, in the needle and it's not going to paint well for long. I'm going to take an airbrush needle here, and this is an Iwata needle, a really nice straight Iwata needle, and I'm going to bend it, and I'm going to show you how to fix it. Okay, now that's a pretty significant bend. I'll even bend it a little more. People cringe around here when I do this, but it works pretty good. We can fix them pretty good. Okay, now we'll have Kate. I'll hold this to see if you can show the people at home just what kind of a bend I put in that. Put something black behind it. Oh, yeah, they can. See, I can see it. <laughs> okay, now used to be we would throw a needle like this away, and we would order. Um, I'm not sure. I think Iwata and maybe uh, Carter Steenbeck, Steenbeck's are in excess of $40 now. They're, they're not cheap. They're very expensive. I don't have a catalog in front of me to look it up. But you can try bending that back um, just like I bent it you know, when I kinked it over, but you're never going to get it straight. You're going to get an S in it. It's going to be all kinds of wiggles in that needle. This is a Sharpen Air by Chad Elliott, and this little tool will save your airbrush needles. It's plastic in here. It's got abrasive stones, and it's got four holes in it. And again, um, they don't come with directions. You gotta YouTube them, and they have great um, YouTube videos on, on how to sharpen your needle with a sharpen air. And they have different grits. Um, the first hole is to straighten your needle and it's kind of coarse. The second one 
is to is much finer and will polish your needle. The third one is like for the shoulder, and the fourth one is a real fine um, abrasive that's going to take the scratches out. If you have a lot of scratches in your needle from sharpening, that's going to cling to the paint. The paint will cling to it also and uh, will not work well. So I'm going to put the needle in the first hole, and I'm just going to, it says, twist it for 12 to 15 times. And it was so bent that when I stuck it in here, um, it didn't even want to turn and caught on the first stone. So, it was really bent, so I'm, it's straighter, but I'm going to put it back in and do it a little more. And you can keep running the hole, you can go from hole to hole to hole, and you can start over and do it again. Um, sometimes when they're really bent, that's necessary. can feel when I pull it out it caught so that means it's kind of bent and it's pretty straight I am going to go back over start at the beginning in a minute here and tomorrow it's going to be 10 below and for our listeners in countries where they don't use Fahrenheit, use Celsius, um, I had to look it up. Uh, 10 below is minus 23 degrees Celsius. That is very cold. So if, if you're some of our Australia and New Zealand people who are sitting in a nice toasty 70 degree lawn chair, we're going to be 23 Celsius below. David says he bent his as soon as he got it out of the package. Well, David, you're going to need to get a sharpen air. Um, there, um, I think the sharpen air is $44. And um, I think a needle might not be that much, but Use it two times, you're gonna pay for it. Oh, it's looking real straight. Now that looks very straight. Now I like to run it between steel wool. Be careful doing this, because I have run it through my finger doing this, but it, this is like four aught steel wool, and it um, really takes any scratches out of your needle. Now that looks pretty straight to me. Let's see if you can see that. Looks better. I still have a little kink to one side. I think I'd probably go through the whole thing again. But uh, that will save your save your needles um, good enough to use again. You can always tell if your needle's bent if you can't quite see it. Um, put it through some steel wool or a piece of cloth and it will snag. And if it snags, you know you're going to have to straighten it up. But that's a great product by Chad Elliott and use it over and over. This thing will probably sharpen hundreds of needles, you know, before. Um, and, and you can replace the stones on them too. Yeah, take care of your needles, take care of your airbrushes. Okay, when we, uh, like I said, we use acrylic paints and with acrylic paints, we're not very concerned about uh, breathe in fumes like we are with lacquer. Uh, we're not, we don't fill up the whole room with uh, vapors like we do with some of the different um, solvents that we spray. So 
when we're using lacquers, um, it's a good idea to have a respirator. Um, respirators are necessary. If you start painting with one and paint for a few years without, it's really hard to get used to wearing one when somebody tells you you better start wearing a respirator. Um, the, uh, if you start right off the bat, the minute, if you've never, if you've never airbrushed before, and I'm telling you, get a respirator and wear it. If you wear it from the first time, it'll just be second nature and you'll pick it up before you even pick up your airbrush. So these are very necessary. The cloth ones um, are not adequate. Um, these have um, charcoal filters in them and you, the cloth ones will maybe stop some of the particles, but it doesn't stop the fumes. So you'll want this. Also, there's these little cartridges, if I can get them off. These are replaceable. And years ago, I thought if I had a respirator, I was good. And I was at a show, giving a seminar, and there's a gentleman that worked for uh, Pittsburgh Paint and Glass and informed Brett and I that these canisters are have a very short lifespan and wearing a respirator with a bad filter on it um, is not going to do you any good. So, so follow the directions, manufacturer's directions and um, maybe even show you how to get it together and change your canisters like you're supposed to. So it's very important. These are not expensive. Um, they have a cloth filter here. Um, they have charcoal filter here. There's different canisters for different purposes. So read the back of the label and um, see which whatever product you're using and what respirator you're going to want to have. Another thing that you're going to want to be concerned with with lacquer paint is it's good to have some kind of an exhaust fan. I've had a lot of exhaust fans over the years. Um, you want something that is spark proof that doesn't have um, the fumes can't get to a spark in the motor. So an open motor is not adequate. You have to have something that has a sealed motor so there's not an exposed spark. Um, at one time, I had a small squirrel cage fan with a real small, probably a 10th horse motor on it. And I was working out of my basement and I suspended it by metal strapping. So it sat right here. It sucked all my fumes out. I had a dryer hose that went to my basement window. And uh, I, I couldn't put a big hole in the wall and put out any kind of exhaust fan that sucked out the side of the wall. So I had just a dryer hose. And when I was done painting, I pulled the whole dryer hose in, the expandable dryer hose in, and closed my window. It worked very, very well um, for a small paint booth. And my paint booth was probably half the size of this table here. Worked really well. Um, when I got into a bigger shop, I had in the window, I had a, a, I think they call them a livestock fan or a hog house fan, and they also have a sealed motor. I didn't know anything about CFMs and how much air I'm moving. Um, that takes, that takes a, um, you know, a heating and cooling specialist to, uh, figure square footage and cubic footage and things like that. Um, all I did was stuck it in the window. When I turned it on, you couldn't even close the front door. There was so much suction. So there is a little bit of a science to that on how much air you're sucking out. But the little hog house fans worked really good and they have the, the wings on the outside that uh, open up when you use them and they close when you're not. I had a little uh, insulated plug that I put in there that worked very well in the winter time. And when I wanted to use my fan, I would pull the plug out, turn it on, and it was very, very quiet. Now, in this building, when we have the taxidermy school, 
Um, we had to have explosion proof fans. Explosion proof fans are much more expensive and um, this one is very, very noisy and we don't use it very much anymore because of the acrylic paints. But if we spray lacquers, we do use it. We do fiberglassing and things like that. <clears throat> so we do have an explosion proof fan and the same principle, it's got little wings that open up and blow the fumes out. Yeah. We've got a couple questions. Cindy would like to know, how do you store your respirator? Um, I put mine in a plastic bag. I'm sure if I Googled it or read the directions or something, it would tell you what to do. And I, I put it in a plastic bag um, for two reasons. I think it keeps the charcoal filters fresher, but I also think that um, it keeps my respirator from getting dirty. And if it gets filled up with dust or whatever we're working on in the shop, I'm going to be breathing more stuff when I put it on than when I don't have it on. Okay, and then Fred would like to know, his lacquer paints get thick when he uses them for deer seasons. He was told to add thinner to the original bottle. How many times can I add it before thinning too much? We'll, uh, we'll go over that in a few minutes here. Um, we thin our lacquer paints a lot. And I'm also gonna show you how to keep it fresher too. Um, so that it, I think you're probably evaporating out the solvent in it and and um, so it is thickening for you. So I'll show you that shortly. Um, there's two, two types of, or two brands of lacquer paints that we come in con uh, contact with. When I first started, we had oil paints and I was shown how to take a tube of like Grum Grumbacher paint and it's the stuff that, like in a toothpaste tube, you squeeze it out, it comes out like toothpaste. It's very, very thick. We thin that with turpentine, um, stirred it up in turpentine, and then we strained it. And I think you've probably heard us talk before, um, it painted beautifully. It um, sprayed real, real nice, and, and, um, but it didn't dry. It was very slow to dry. And there were some colors that, that took three to four days to dry, especially the um, the warmer colors like the yellows and the reds and the oranges seem to take a long time to dry. So in the olden days when we did fish, our whites and blacks were sign paint, oil paint, and they dried within a couple hours. So we would paint the back of the fish, belly white, back black, and when, we, when it was dried, we'd flip them over and we would paint the front. So the front of the fish was the only part that was ever painted only because it took too long for the paint to dry and we'd never get a fish done if we had to wait four days for the front to dive, dry before we could paint the black. Um, I just uh, was at a show this weekend and I saw um, some fish that a person had done that had painted the backs black and I thought that was very similar to um, what we used to do. And the back also showed a lot of dust if you painted it black so we got started painting them silver on the back and silver doesn't show dust so I, it's kind of interesting how we got to where we are from from way back there um, but uh, um, the oil paints was the first thing that we ever used because there were not any airbrush paints and we uh, then somebody started using automotive paint and if you're familiar with automotive paint that was fine but if you've never used it and you go to a, a Napa or an auto motor supply, it's your head will spin with all the different additives and um, things that you can put in it and solvents and reducers. And it was very difficult to learn. I think Jim Hall um, from Idaho was the first person to come out with airbrush paint um, and that turned into the um, poly transfer brand of airbrush paint with Bob Williamson um, of the Breakthrough Magazine and Wasco Supply Company. So that was the first airbrush paint in a lacquer version and then um, Lifetone was soon on the scene and uh, we've used Lifetone for years and years and years. And Lifetone looks kind of like this in a plastic bottle. And when you get this, it will settle out a lot. 
settles out. You'll have a lot of pigment on the bottom and probably some solvent in here. So uh, when the question was, when it thickens, um, the solvent in here actually evaporates somehow and you're left with a whole bunch of sediment, which is your pigment. So you have to restore that, rejuvenate that somehow, and that's why we're talking about thinning it. So I'm gonna mix up a few bottles here and, and show you, you know, how we treat lacquer paint. Uh, Cody would like to know, do the acrylic paints work as good as the lacquer paints? We think they work great. Uh, I, I described this last week. Um, I started out with, with uh, a brand of acrylic paint 25 years ago. And I was bound and determined to not breathe lacquer anymore. And so I got $300 worth of acrylic paint and hated it. It was very difficult to use. It was, I couldn't make it work. Uh, lacquer paint is very, very user friendly. I did not like my acrylic paints. I let them all dry up. Five years later, I do it again. Another $300 worth of paint, hated it. Another three years later, I do the same thing. So I've done this many times. Createx paint with a little bit of guidance um, made a huge difference and paints very, very well for us without the fumes. So we switched, I'd say three years ago and have a look back, it's great. Yeah. Sandy would like to know, doesn't the lacquer thinner dry out your airbrushes, O-rings faster or deteriorate them faster? I think so, yes. Um, the H airbrush has a little O-ring between, between the needle and the cone, and then another one between this shroud and the barrel. And on all of my, I have a lot of H airbrushes because we used to have a line of 16 of them. We picked up white, we picked up red, we never had to clean out an airbrush and have the color in it um, for production work. And all of our O-rings were eaten away. But most of these newer airbrushes Carter Steenbeck, um, I think the Pache as well as the Iwatas all have O-rings that are in, in rubber and synthetic parts that are impervious to lacquer thinners and, and breaking down. So I don't think that's a problem anymore like it used to be. Um, the plastics used to get eaten by lacquer thinner and like you said, dried out. Not only dried out, but disintegrated. Okay, and is it acceptable for competition work to paint the backs black? You better check with your competition. If I'm judging a show and a person has a beautiful front and painted the back black and another person has a beautiful front and back, I'm going to lean towards, you know, that person's going to get a higher score. Um, that went to the effort. I would at least, um, and a lot of, um, I know um, a lot of the shows for the professional division, um, some of them are one-sided fish. So just make sure, um, check the rules and ask. But that does bias the judge quite a bit if the person went to the effort on the back of the fish. And then Nicole would like to know where could I purchase a ventilation fan? I am claustrophobic and have a hard time keeping my mask on. First, you gotta, I gotta know what you're gonna paint. Are you gonna paint lacquers or are you gonna paint acrylics? If you're gonna paint acrylics, we don't run a fan because the acrylic paints are a little bit heavier and when you spray them, they just go down. Um, like you saw last week when we did it, we did not have fumes. Um, I will probably have, you will see a haze when I start painting lacquers. If you're using lacquers, a bonafide explosion proof fan is very expensive, um, but a sealed motor one, like at a Parmer Fleet or um, any of those tractor supply, those type of stores, has a motor that is not going, it doesn't have any open spark, it's not going to 
um, explode on you or start a fire. And um, um, you could put that right, we used to have ours, a piece of board, plywood, with a hole in it. <clears throat> the fan was screwed to the plywood and I'd lift up my double hung windows, stick it in and pull them down. Worked really, really well. So um, that's where I would look. If you want a bonafide explosion proof fan, um, then you're gonna have to go to uh, probably a heating and cooling person like a air conditioner type place and they will order something like that. And they will size your room the proper way so you're not sucking your doors and windows in and your walls are bowing in, you know. That'd be the right way to do it. And then are acrylic and lacquer paints interchangeable on the same mount? I do it all the time and I think Brett does also. Um, Life Tone is gonna say, do not do that. Createx is gonna say, do not do that. Um, I have no problem painting lacquers and coming back over um, with acrylics. I would not put them on wet. You know, don't don't paint a heavy coat of something and then and then of acrylic and then come in with your um, lacquer paint. But we do it quite often and um, have never had an adverse reaction. But if you're worried about it, we do test a lot, and a lot of we have a lot of plexiglass around here for doing different base work and ice scenes. Um, we'll take a piece of plexiglass and paint, uh, maybe lacquer on it, and then come and paint our acrylic on it over there and watch it, and even put on a, a magnifying visor and watch it really, really close, because um, if you see blistering or bubbling or anything like that, something's not right, but we do it quite often and get by with it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you, first of all, just simple mixing and with lacquer paint. First of all, you can use lacquers straight out of the bottle. They're all airbrush ready. We find that they paint a little bit easier and trouble free if we kind of mix a concoction, which I'm going to show you. So right out of the bottle, they're going to be able to be mixed. Now they do settle out a lot. So like anything, um, the Createx, the, any of the acrylics settle out a lot also. Um, shake them real good. Now, do, um, I'm going to mix, let's just assume that I'm going to just use a little bit of this uh, mallard orange. I'm not, I'm not going to paint 100 fish. I'm not going to mix a bunch that I'm going to store. This is only for a one-time deal. I'm going to put a little bit of mallard orange in here. First, I'm going to take the <laughs> inside cap off, maybe. Now it'll work better. Now, the thing with lacquers. Um, we can thin this as thin as we want. I can fill that up to here and spray mostly lacquer thinner with a little bit of paint in it and it's going to give me a orange hue. Or I can spray it straight like this and it's going to give me a vivid orange paint. Or I can add as much thinner as I want. Now. I said thinner, and that's that's the wrong thing to tell you. There's two products when it comes to um, both lacquers and acrylics. There's thinners and there's reducers. A thinner, we buy thinner. You can get this at a hardware store or you can get it at an auto parts store. This is lacquer thinner. We find that it does not thin the paint very well. It does bad things to your paint. Lacquer thinner. We want a lacquer reducer instead to thin our paint. We use this all the time to clean our equipment. Um, we we'll wash birds in it, um, clean our airbrushes, clean our cups, clean everything that the lacquer has stuck to. We use lacquer thinner because it's less expensive. 
this is a very big secret that you're going to want to remember. This is lacquer reducer. You can get both at the, at the um, auto parts store. That would be a low grade lacquer thinner. This is lacquer reducer. And then every company has this. This is um, MNI, Pittsburgh Paint and Glass. Um, every company has it. Now, another thing you're going to see on this label is it's called Slow Reducer. And Slow Reducer keeps your paint from drying too fast. Lacquer paint dries extremely fast. The nice thing when we painted fish, I told you, with oils, um, it was three to four days before we could touch that fish. We had to make a cradle for them, paint the fish, and couldn't touch it for three to four days. With lacquer paint, you can touch that fish in three to four seconds. It dries very, very fast. Sometimes so fast that it dries in your tip and your airbrush quits spraying. I don't want it to dry that fast. I use a slow reducer. There are also fast reducers. And I don't really know what I'm talking about, but I think it's about evaporation rate. So for painting with lacquers, thin your paint, not with thinner, but with reducer. And a slow reducer works well. You can get, a, and we did it for years, um, you can get lacquer thinner from the hardware store in a little gallon can like that. Um, thin all your paint. Once you try a reducer, you're going to find that it was the way to go. Okay, um, I got a little bit of paint in here. I want to reduce it um, just for squirtability. I took my reducer and I put it in this plastic bottle rather than trying to dump this in there. I am going to reduce my paint as much as I feel I need. Um, like I said, it will spray great as it is. I'm going to put in probably 25% or a fourth of this amount. And you can stir it up with a stick, you can swirl it around, it mixes very, very easily. Then, we have found that Lifetone and all other lacquer paint companies make a retarder. And a retarder is going to slow this down even more. Like I said, um, I said three to four seconds. It might be a little longer than that. Three to four seconds, I put a slow reducer in it. It's going to slow it down a little bit more, maybe another three to four seconds. I'm going to add just a few drops of reducer. And where you'll notice that's very helpful is, for instance, train, painting trout spots. You're going to go, if you ever painted with an airbrush, you're trying to make a spot, you go spot, 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 whoops, it's not working. And then psh, you get it all over the place. Um, the slow reducer will help you. You're going to get maybe six or seven or eight spots. A little bit of retarder. Do it in drops. A little bit of retarder. I put in about 10 drops. Um, all of a sudden, you're getting about 20 spots before you have to flush out your brush or clean the tip and start over again. If you're not getting enough of vermiculation, you know, like doing on northern fins is another thing. You're trying to trying to do a nice little line, all of a sudden it quits spraying because your lacquer is drying in your tip, put in a couple more drops of reduce or retarder. Retarder is your friend. Too much retarder it won't set up, so do drops. Don't, don't mix it extremely retarder rich. Okay, um, I did this in a little plastic or a little uh, wax cup. If I'm going to paint, if I have a mallard to do and I'm going to paint his feet, this is exactly how I do it. If I have a flock of mallards that I'm going to paint, I would probably mix it in something like this. 
or a bottle like this. There's all, you're just going to have to tailor this to your method of painting. Now, this works really good in this little wax cup, but I do notice, um, and I don't see any adverse effects, effects to it, but I do notice that the wax dissolves in a wax cup with lacquer paint slash thinner retarder. So get your painting done, discard this and throw it away. Uh, Craig made a good note to let beginners know not to try this in a styrofoam cup. <laughs> that is, uh, that's kind of funny because um, I was getting ready for the um, show today and there was a styrofoam cup in the garbage and I thought I'll just pour it in there, it's going to eat it anyway and then, <laughs> sure enough it will eat styrofoam. Um, but it'll also dissolve that wax so do it quickly and use it and then discard this. And then if you want to know how to discard it, the best thing um, we found is we have a tote, kind of one of those tubs, um, filled with kitty litter or oil dry. And um, we just dump this right in our kitty litter and oil dry and it soaks it up, clumps like the clumping kitty litter and dries really well. And uh, we can bag it up and throw it in the garbage. Brandon says, I want to give the Createx paint a try, but I'm particularly colorblind. Is there a color conversion chart out there for life tone to Createx? Um, no, not yet. That's something we will work on. Um, we've been talking about, there's, there is, it's a different method of painting, and we've been, we do have a warm water fish kit. I think we have a bird kit. We have a uh, game head kit and things like that. But we will, if, if we live long enough, come up with a, come up with a nice um, spray system with color so you'll know what to do. But as of yet, we don't. Um, but if you call, we can point you to this, 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 this. Jerry would like to know what is the purpose for adding reducer? The reducer is to thin your um, lacquer paint and it will spray really um, thick paint tends to not spray as nice. By thinning it, it's going to spray really pretty. I mean, you're going to like the way it sprays. Heather says, I like the results that lacquer gives me. However, with my current working environment, using them is not feasible. Will you be doing a live with past pastels for finished work anytime soon? Um, we can do that. Pastels, somebody called the other day and they said they were painting everything with pastels. Some people do that. That's not my method. My method would be um, if I were painting, I use mallard again for, a, for an example. If I were painting mallard feet, I would take Createx or lacquer in this color and I would give them a base coat. Then I would come in with my pan pastels and either the little applicators or the paintbrush and I would brush it on like makeup and then seal it. If it's not vibrant enough, a little bit more then seal it. It works really, really well. But my method, um, although some people will paint totally with pan pastels, my method is to put down a base of paint first. And um, yes, we can do that in the future if you remember. And <laughs> you're always looking for ideas. But um, you can paint with pan pastels, but what you'd have to do is put down your color, seal it, put down the same color, seal it, paint down the same color, seal it until you get them vibrant enough to make it work. Uh, Randy would like to know if we have kits for the Createx paints and do we do we? have some. Yeah. You have a lot of questions I know. Today. Yeah. Stuff. This is way easier with questions <laughs> people. Um, don't be afraid to ask anything. That's how you learn. Um, remember the only dumb question is the one, you know, whatever they say. Oh, no question is a dumb question. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I'm going to show you a couple more things. You're going to have bottles like this for some of your airbrushes. Um, this single action SAR of Iwata takes a bottle, 
So you mix up your paint, put it in a bottle, um, sits like that, paint um, whatever you want. You can switch bottles out. Or like when we had the eight airbrushes, we had at school we had 16 people paint, or we had four people painting with four different colors, 16 um, colors total. But you used a lot of bottles. When you um, mix in a bottle, I want these to. I'm not going to clean these out every day. I'm going to keep my bottles around for months and months and months. So if I'm going to mix in a bottle. We'll come up with a different color here. Remember to shake these up really good. Now, like somebody asked, why do I thin it? Um, you don't have to. And, but they paint nicer and especially on fish, it works really well to allow the fish's, um, I call them values, the dark spots, uh, the markings, um, you know, the stripes on a perch, that sort of thing. If you paint with a real solid color like this, you're going to cover up all of his markings. If you dilute that and put it on more like a dye, um, the markings come out and they will show you where they are. Um, trout spots, marks on perch, bluegill, bass, smallmouth. A lot of times if you put your paint on light enough, you'll be able to see them. That's another um, reason that we use a lot of uh, reducer. Okay. Remember, I'm thinning with reducer, not thinner. I'm putting drops of retarder in. Now, the way I would know if I need more retarder, the way I would know is I'm getting the tip dry. It's not painting nice for me, so I would put um, more retarder in. Now, a lot of times on the, I didn't do it on this one. A lot of times when I put the bottles together, um, especially when we had students um, I use Teflon tape around the lid, just wrap it around the lid and you don't have to worry about um, paint leaking out through the seam. I just do something like this, bust it off. And when I fill it up with paint, take it down. That way if you ever lean way over too far, that lacquer paint is thin and it will sometimes leak out if your lid's not on tight. So I like to put a little Teflon tape on it. Okay, there's a couple colors. Um, you notice these little red things are ready caps. Um, ready caps are little plastic caps that fit right over your siphon tube like that. And by taking even a little breather hole, first thing to check if you're painting with bottles and something quits painting, check that breather hole. If that breather hole gets clogged by splashed up paint, um, it won't paint. There, it, it's a suction in there, no paint will come out. Um, the first thing I always do is I have a pin laying on the table and I poke it down through the breather hole to make sure it's not clogged. To store this paint, I put the ready cap on, use them over and over, you don't need to buy new. Um, put a T-pin down in the hole. That will keep for months before it starts hardening up on you in there or thickening up on you. And Jacob would like to know what type of airbrush paint would be best to paint a deer skull? A deer skull? Mm -hmm. A deer skull, I would, it, it doesn't matter um, what kind of paint. Um, you're going to want to seal the deer skull really well so that the paint doesn't soak in and get, um, it's like painting on a sponge because the deer skull is kind of porous. Um, but either lacquers or acrylics, either one would work fine for that. 
And then you're going to want to seal it with something afterwards, like either um, you know, a matte finish or a fix it tip or some kind of sealer. You're going to want to seal it afterwards. Um, okay, I wanted to show you something else here too. This paint, this is a red, dark red. This is something that lacquer is very, very handy for. Um, there is no paint left in here. I mean, there is just a little bit of sludge, I would call it. And I can rejuvenate that. There wasn't much in here and I dumped it all out before, but a lot of times your paints will sit around and I did this for a competition one time before we had the supply company and I needed a pearl of some sort or a silver or a metallic something and all I had was one dried up bottle from, I think it was a tin, tin can um, polytransport used to come in um, and it was dried up hard. I took, I couldn't order it, I didn't have time. I took lacquer thinner, put lacquer thinner in, shook it up, and I have as good a paint as I purchased. It's good to go. And all it was was nothing but thick, thick sludge in there. Now that is a rich, rich, rich nice dark red paint and all I did was like the person that said their paint thickens um, all I did was add a little bit of thinner to it. I'm going to put a little retarder in that and it's good to go. Okay, let's see if any of these are going to work. Um, some of the, the bigger cup size, the C's, um, I think both um, Iwata as well as Harder Steamback come with a lid on them also. Uh, be careful, we talked about the guy with the rooster fish that tipped over his bottle and spilled it. Be careful with, um, with those. We never use lids, but we should. Okay, now this is, I don't know if you can see that, Kate, this is. I think we've got a decent view. Pretty fine? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. um, double action by pulling back on the trigger, you get a wider spray. Now, when you thin it, you also lost the intensity. So in order to get back the vibrance that you wanted, it, it is, the thinner you make it, you're going to have to go over it a couple more times. But it's safer for us to do that than to um, have too thick of a paint. And do you recommend wearing gloves? Um, I think it's probably a good idea because when I get done painting with lacquers, I have paint everywhere, a lot of paint. So it's not a bad idea. And Michael would like to know if the gravity or siphon is works best, what works best? My thinking was, because I'd used siphon all my life, all my tax every life, uh, my thinking was it only makes sense that gravity is going to make it come out easier. So um, I was used to the um, eight chair brushes and VLs, and when I went to gravity, I thought it was going to be magically better, you know, and it really wasn't. David McLean says, LOL, that was me with the rooster fish. I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> he said he's gotten more careful since then. Uh, Keith would like to know, how did you get the pencil line? 
um, the pencil line is going to be um, not with this airbrush, probably um, with the harder steam backs or the, you're going to want probably a 0.2 to do a pencil line. Like when you showed that, I was surprised your picture looked as big. This is very, very fine. But when you showed it on the screen, it's, I looked at it and I went, whoa, that's, my line looks better than that. Yeah, where you have it zoomed out a little bit there. Uh, what is the best way you have found to clear water from your airbrush system after condensation forms? Is there an ideal temperature in your painting area to decrease condensate in the air system? Most on our, we have a little, um, we have a little white water compressor here and it has water filters in it. Um, some airbrushes have a water trap in them. In your airline, if you have an airline coming to your airbrush, they make a, um, you can put a little drop down in it where water connects and you can take it out. There's a lot of ways to do that. Um, I was going to show you, this is a brand new tip, and, and it's spraying very, very coarse. Anytime your paint is coarse, we told you last week, coarseness is caused from two things. One is too thick of paint or not enough air to suck the paint out. So I'm going to put a little more thinner in here. And that was an old bottle of paint, probably really thick. I put some reducer again. I'm thinning with reducer, not thinner. And I just put a bunch more in and see if I can't get a nicer spray. Now any of this paint, like I said, we started, um, we started using acrylics three years ago or moved to acrylics three years ago. Um, to shake these up, I'm going to just hold my finger over that breather hole. Very important. You'll find that out the hard way if you don't. And over that end and just shake it up. Um, so any of these lacquer paints that I'm using, they've been sitting in our paint shelf for at least three years. And probably much more than that. Jacob would like to know what airbrush you recommend for beginners. This is very much nicer now. Um, just because I thin the paint. Um, the, the beginner of all beginners, however, there are a lot of modified artists using it, is this H airbrush. Very, very inexpensive. Um, let me see what I can get the line out of it. That's, this is a $40 airbrush. The line is noticeably coarser than the $300 airbrush, but still that's very impressive for an inexpensive airbrush. Now I could, I can paint, um, just to give you an idea, I'm painting a small amount of paint for a long time here without the tip getting dry. If I was doing trout spots, You know, I have no, uh, it, it has no intention of quitting making the same size spot. And I'm making the same size spot because I adjusted it up here. But that's, that's a $40 airbrush and uh, it's, it's very impressive airbrush for the money. That's his beginner, beginner price, but still a high quality item. Now to clean these out, if, um, 
if I'm painting lacquers, a lot of times I'll have a bottle like this filled with lacquer thinner, and I'll take that bottle, squirt lacquer thinner through it until it's clean, and then I'll switch to another color. Um, for instance, let's see, I had a bottle here. No problem. This is a color cup for the little H's, and uh, I was going to clean it out, and I put it in thinner, but it got all cocky. Now here's that red that was all... Soaked up in there. Uh, let's see. Now this is the, the red that I said dried up and I just added thinner to it. And that's out of a bottle. And that's what we usually do is just kind of spray the excess out, add a little thinner. Um, any of these, uh, you're looking at, I don't know, $240 for those. They're advanced airbrushes, but not, not that a beginner can't start with an advanced airbrush. Well, this will paint very, very fine lines as well as a big swath. And with a smaller cup, I ran out of paint. Um, with a smaller cup, um, you just can't paint as large of items with it. To clean these out, we uh, fill it full of now this is, typically I'll use the low grade lacquer thinner to clean them out because it's cheaper. I use a Q-tip to clean out the bowl. By holding your finger in front of it, you will create a back pressure and it boils like boiling water. And then I just spray the thinner completely out. Um, I haven't been painting enough to get a big haze in here, but usually you will see a, a haze. But that's kind of, um, lacquer paints are easy to use. Um, if, if I had to say anything negative about lacquer paints, it's the fumes. That's, uh, that's kind of it. They paint good. They're, um, like you saw this, I had nothing but sludge. I created paint by just adding thinner to it. Um, all of these paints are at least three years old and maybe older. Um, they work good, they color good, um, and that's kind of the story on lacquer paint. Remember, thin them with reducer, not thinner. So I'm using the, I keep saying that because I started out telling you to thin them. Um, but uh, a slow grade reducer keeps them painting so that you can 
do fine lines like that or trout spots or eyelids on a deer. You don't want to get halfway around a deer eyelid and all of a sudden it's not working. Um, so that's what this will help you do. A little bit of retarder helps keep them very, very clean. Um, when they get, if you're not painting, if they're not painting and you clean them every time, you may have to dismantle them to clean them. Um, the tips inside of here, I think Brett showed you last week, are micro, micro tips. And if you take them apart and drop them, you'll never find them. They're very, very small. Um, I had a couple of airbrushes that I was using at home and um, good, good airbrushes. And I was having a difficult time getting them to paint and I had to strip them down. You just, there's points where you just have to take them apart and clean every little bit out of them. Whether you're using um, acrylics or lacquers, there's still residual paint in the barrel and um, it'll keep them from painting. I think that's it. Awesome. And today we have, for a giveaway, an airbrush cleaning kit. Mm -hmm. And I want to say also, um, you know, in here are these little bitty brushes. In here. Be careful. Um, they'll have a little twisted steel on the end. I like to take that and snip it off so I don't scratch the inside of my airbrush. But these are very good for cleaning your airbrushes as well as a, a big one for the bigger parts and outside of your airbrush with that. And all you have to do is like and share, like and share. Mm -hmm, that's correct. And the winner is? The winner is K Eagle Wolf Mabry. Say it again. K Eagle Wolf Mabry. K. Yeah. Congratulations, K. You got yourself an airbrush cleaning kit. Awesome. And you get it with your first order, is that correct? Yes, okay. that is correct. So make sure to like and share this video to be entered in next week's giveaway. Thanks for joining us and we will take into consideration all the ideas we had for another show and come up with something new for you. Yeah.